Hi, I'm Zena Waldridge and I'm Dementia Nurse Consultant at Norfolk and Waveney Integrated Care Board as we're now known. This session is going to be about raising awareness of domestic abuse and dementia. Um, not a tough uh, subject that people often put the two words together. Um, so this is really just about putting it on people's radar and getting you to think about situations you might be in both now and in the future and, and what to be looking for. What, what would be a red flag to you? So one of the first things to probably think about is what do we mean by domestic abuse and domestic violence? The, the term is more now domestic abuse as opposed to domestic violence, but they're often used interchangeably. So it's best to cover that off in this conversation. So it's about um, instance of controlling, coercive or threatening behaviour, violence or abuse between those aged 16 or over. And it may be an intimate part partner, it may be a family member. Um, and it's not reliant on someone's gender or sexuality. So this is not just a male on female occurrence, it's not within just marriages, it can be much broader than that. So I think it's really important for people to be more aware of that. And it could be psychological, physical, sexual, violence and emotional. And these are all kind of things that are familiar to us in the context of safeguarding. Um, and of course, we've got the safeguarding training videos available within this suite of options. So please do have a look at those to look in these, these sort of areas in more depth in the context of wider safeguarding. So what do we mean by controlling behaviour? It's kind of one of those things that could mean different things to different people. So it's really important we kind of have a clear sense of what that means. So you'll see here by the definitions, and of course I, I'm reading them verbatim because these are how they're defined, is a range of acts designed to make a person subordinate or not dependent by isolating them from sources of support, exploiting their resources and capacities for personal gain, depriving them of the needs, means of needs for independence, resistance and escape and regulating their everyday behaviour. What it doesn't say is that it's intentional. And that's really important because what I want you to think about is how might some of those scenarios be played out in caring relationships between people with dementia and their carers and family members, um, and not necessarily intentionally, but as a consequence of their situation. Similarly with coercive behaviour, an act or a pattern of acts of assault, threats, humiliation and intimidation or other abuse that is used to harm, punish or frighten their victim. It includes honour-based violence, female genital mutilation, forced marriages um, and it's again clearly defined that it's not about one gender or eth ethnicity that this might happen. But again if you look at those earlier um, sort of definitions of coercive behaviour. Again, these might be experienced by people with dementia from their family carers um, as part of a longitudinal relationship that's been difficult or as the impact on their health, their situation, their inability to manage their current situation because of being a carer or person with dementia. So it's about thinking about it slightly differently to what you might have done in the past. I have to say I probably was quite naive um, many years ago thinking that domestic violence and domestic abuse doesn't happen in, uh, in older people. We all tend to have this lovely perception of what a, a, you know an older person is and that they're safe and they're protected and they're respected. But of course we know sadly the world isn't always like that. So if you look here, you can start to see that this is quite a significant problem. Um, between 2015 and 2016, there was a report that established that over 120,000 people aged 65 and over had experienced at least one form of abuse. And of course, this is often about the people we know about. We also know that older people are less likely to report domestic abuse um, and, and may have been, you know, experiencing those that abuse for some time without doing anything about it because they don't know where to go and how to get that, that support. As you say, it says that there's lots of issues um, around you know, people with older people accessing support and it could be that actually professionals working with them don't give them the same opportunities to report um, and know how to support them in the way that they would perhaps a younger person who's experiencing it. One of this is, this is where I was trying to get to with it, this sort of the, the coerciveness um, type thing, is older people are likely to be dependent on the person who's abusing them. 
and, and very few older people um, will have the access to professional support. We, also, we know a lot of older people and their family carers um, are really struggling to cope on a day-to-day -day basis without any formal support from um, services. So again, it can go under the radar and undetected. And when we don't, although again, we don't like to think about it, but domestic homicides, that's where the, the perpetrator is known to the victim within a family scenario often. One in four fic victims of domestic homicides are aged over 60. We've had some local cases in the last few years um, relating to um, domestic homicides um, and with people with dementia and their family carers. So although it's incredibly rare, it does happen. And for us, what the important thing about um, raising awareness of domestic abuse and safeguarding is, is the sooner that we can identify the problem, the sooner we can try and mitigate the risk of some of these more severe events happening. So that's why I'm saying, you know, just be mindful, be aware, think about it, and, and you know, know where to go if you do identify a problem. This is taken from a report, and you can start to see here the real extent of of, of the problem and also what happens in terms of those relationships. So victims aged 61 are more likely to experience abuse from a, an adult family member or their current intimate partner. And that's different to those under age 60. So it's really important to understand there is a slight difference. Older victims are significantly more likely to have a disability. So not just dementia, it might be other health and social care issues that impact on that. So again, we're talking about this vulnerable group that as carers, as professionals, we are more likely to have on our radar. It also talks about the fact that older victims are less likely to attempt to leave before accessing help, which is interesting. And they're more likely to be living with the perpetrator after getting support. So again, looking at the different structures of those relationships, different needs, and how we mitigate the risk and support those individuals rather than perhaps criminalise it in the way that we might do in other scenarios. So why is domestic abuse different for older people? We've kind of started to touch on it, but it could be that they've become very isolated because they're the carer or they're the person with dementia themselves. So that means that they've become more socially withdrawn. Um, and that means they might not be able to access that help and support. They may not even be aware that their situation is abusive. They may see it as normal. It's not always about the fact that, you know, this is a new thing. For some older people, they may have been in an abusive relationship for a long time. I certainly know from some of the families that I've worked with, I've heard a lot of uh, partners particularly say that they wish they'd left the relationship a long time ago, um, but it wasn't socially acceptable. They would have been stigmatised, perhaps. Um, they didn't have the financial means to leave. All of those kind of factors that they, they've highlighted to me in my clinical practice. Um, and then there's this kind of sense of duty. A lot of partners have said to me particularly, or children, um, you know, I, I wish I'd have made that step before dementia got in the way, for example, or before they became unwell, because now I feel guilty and I feel I can't leave because I feel a moral obligation to stay. So there might be lots of those kind of really complex emotions and relationship issues that impact on someone because of those kind of cared for relationships. Again, we think about the fact that someone might be physically dependent or, men, you know, on the, on the other person, so it might just be practically more difficult to get support. There might be a cultural misconception by us as professionals that older people don't experience domestic abuse. And I think it's really important from, you know, just highlighting that, that you know, it can happen to anyone, regardless of age, regardless of gender, and regardless of sexuality. So we do need to just be mindful. And actually, the dynamics of relationships, that control and power that can come from being a carer or a cared for person is something that we might not be as readily um, able to understand and support within the health and social care environment, because it can be quite hidden. So these are some of the challenges that older people face, and it might be why they actually experience it differently. So there's lots of other uh, reasons why it might be detected. Um, and I will come to a couple of case studies later that will help you understand what I mean by this, I hope. So 
Often it's about the assumption that any conflict or abuse is about the stress within a caring relationship. So it, there might be a, perhaps a one-off incident um, and then people say, well, you know, that was because that was really fractious at that point. There was lots of stress. There was lots of difficulties for that individual um, and they just flipped. They may not actually investigate that further to see if there was a, a history within that relationship to understand if it's a one-off. And often in these, I think intent is the word I keep coming back to. And I think intent is one of the things that kind of trips us up in kind of thinking about whether something is domestic abuse or not. Because again, there may not have been any intent to do any harm, um, but it could be that that situation is going to escalate if we don't put some mechanisms in to support them. Coercive and controlling behaviour is very hard to detect, and particularly if it's been going on for a long time, but also by the very nature of it means that people may not speak up freely about it because they don't feel able to. Health professionals might not be comfortable referring to services that they see as domestic abuse um, services because they may feel that it's, it's, it's not traditionally domestic abuse as it's perceived in other situations. So it's about how we change again the way that we perceive domestic abuse, but also domestic abuse specialists themselves may not feel confident in meeting the needs of older people, particularly if there's cognitive impairment involved. Uh, so it is a real challenge um, and I think it's something we need to get better at going forward so that we can make sure that, that we reduce the impact of both the abuse and, and um, this, the, the difficulties that that brings to those individuals. So there's a couple of case studies that might kind of bring to light why we might have seen this differently if we take, you know, if we weren't considering a domestic abusive relationship, we might actually look at this in a slightly different way. But there was a gentleman who was, um, he, he, was, he was caring for his wife who had dementia and they'd had a very long standing abusive relationship. He'd been very controlling, she wasn't able to access her any money, um, you know, she did what she was told when she was told um, and all that kind of thing. You know, she, she, she made sure that all his needs were met, she would run the house. Um, behave in a certain way. He would go out and do his own thing and have a social life and have friends where she was much more isolated within the home and confined to a very small group within her social circle. He belittles her, he makes her feel small and he has done for a long time. Now this lady um, actually has developed dementia. She has now got a diagnosis of dementia um, and he's much more verbally and physically aggressive towards her. And a lot of that is because her dementia makes her quite apathetic. She feels, she doesn't feel engaged in things. So she's finding all the things that she would have done around the house more challenging. Um, and he sees that as, as a weakness in her and, and critiques that quite a lot and actually constantly is, is cross with her that she's not fulfilling his needs. Now, people are quite concerned about this because she has dementia, but at this early stage, this lady still has mental capacity to say, this has always been the case. Um, you know, it's not anything different. Um, she again says she wishes she'd left the marital home a long time ago, but she hasn't. Um, and now she almost feels um, quite needy of her husband because she feels quite vulnerable. Um, she knows that the dementia is going to progress and she doesn't know what she would do on her own. So although at the moment um, there isn't an awful lot we can do, what we can do in terms of, of, of you know, invoking safeguarding, for example, but what we can do is support her and validate her and, and let her know that we understand that, that there is a problem here and that there is a support available to her. But the other thing, of course, is to remember that actually we do need to monitor that situation because if this lady leaves, loses mental capacity, it may then fall into the realms of safeguarding because she may be more, more vulnerable. So I guess my message to you in this one is we can't always make it better, but being aware of it means that we can support and we can plan. And that's really important, particularly for someone like this lady. Another case was um, a lady that I'd worked with um, after a very critical incident with um, her husband. He'd gone missing. We'd never known this couple um, prior in services, only the GP had had contact. Um, the gentleman had gone missing, so the police were involved. 
um, services were involved to try and support the couple when this gentleman was found. Um, and what manifested itself was that this gentleman had had a head injury several years previously um, and then he um, developed vascular dementia. And what his head injury had caused problems with his frontal lobe, so his behaviour had changed, he was quite impulsive, he was quite unkind, he was quite controlling. He hadn't been like that before the head injury. And over time, what had happened was he, he, he would not let his wife out of his sight. He accused her of um, having affairs with other men. He wouldn't let her leave the house um, without him. He would even stand outside the toilet when she was going to the toilet. Um, so her whole 24 hours for the, for the last seven or eight years had been controlled by this, this kind of morbid jealousy, if you like, that this gentleman experienced. And everyone had been really unaware of it because when they were out and about together, having coffee with friends or family, they were quite engaged. You know, he, he could hold a wonderful conversation. He's very articulate. So no one really understood that there was kind of this behavior going on in the background until this situation occurred. And what, of course, is the impact on the wife was that it, it was it was the same as you know anyone would have experienced with that kind of level of control. She had no self esteem. Um, she she daren't even put lipstick on because if she put lipstick on, that would kind of um, exacerbate a, 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 a sort of a um, an argument amongst them. And and so it was very much about reminding her that she was a victim of domestic abuse. But although it wasn't intentional, it was still having the same impact on her. And we needed to support her and to support him to find strategies to make that less damaging to both of them. Um, and, and we did. We worked with that couple for a very long time. Um, and the actual solution for this particular couple was that the gentleman went into residential care not far from the family home so they could still retain that relationship because it was very moving. They were clearly devoted to each other and, and there was a lot of love between them. But obviously this relationship had become very difficult because of the challenges that he faced from his frontal lobe damage, um, from the head injury and from the vascular dementia. So he wasn't intentionally meaning to, to harm his wife, but over time it was having a really detrimental effect. So again, it's about giving people permission, not apportioning blame potentially in situations such as this, but seeing how we can support them more effectively. So if you become aware or you're concerned that there, you might be seeing um, a form of domestic abuse, always seek advice. Uh, you know, that you haven't got to solve this by yourself. There are safeguarding mechanisms in place. Uh, you might want to, in your own organisation, have a domestic abuse champion. So, you know, someone who's trained up, who's your go-to person, who knows how to link into all the local services or to make referrals should it need to be a safeguarding thing. But, you know, be sensitive about how you refer to the abuse because again sometimes the language can alienate people and then stop them from talking to you. It might be that you don't actually use the word to start with but you give permission to explore some of the behaviours that you might be seeing going on um, and it, it could be very different because of the way that it's managed because of that caring and relationship with someone with dementia. So do think about how you um, Encourage the conversation, I guess. It's about trying to keep it quite um, low key, but validating you think there's a problem. And think about the care needs of the carer and the person with dementia and seeing what support can be put in to minimise that risk. It could be respite breaks, it could be extra care and support, it could be about some social prescribing and enable that family or that person to engage with others to give them a break from each other. Uh, because being with someone 24 hours a day, seven days a week is actually quite difficult. Um, I think a lot of us felt that during COVID. I know my husband and I certainly did. You know, and you can still be in a loving care and relationship, but that can become quite abusive because of the frustrations of being together and being dependent on each other. So really be really gentle in how you approach that. But always seek advice would be my priority uh, message to you. If someone does disclose that uh, some abuse, you know, use reassuring things. Go, you're not alone. There is support available. We can get you some help. 
and not that person may not actually want to leave the family home they just might need some support in managing and dealing with the abuse that they are uh, experiencing so you know don't make assumptions about what people want you to do they don't always want you to rescue them they just perhaps need some strategies and support if you think that there might be some immediate risk, make sure that you ask them if they feel safe. It could be that a person with dementia, for example, has been quite aggressive. You can give that family permission to say, you know, you can phone the police in an emergency. You can actually get that support if you don't feel safe. Um, and also make sure that they have access to safe places if this kind of escalates, they know what their escape plan would be um, so that they can actually keep themselves safe until emergency services can arrive. And if they need access to emergency accommodation in any situation, there is a number you can call. But ultimately, this is the bit that actually you would be wanting the specialist practitioners to do. I wouldn't be anticipating you'd be doing this yourself. You'd perhaps want your, your senior colleagues to then engage with, it, with the statutory authorities and the appropriate authorities to arrange this. But certainly you can advocate to families that if they feel unsafe in an emergency, they can contact the police that then might be the trigger that enables us to all get involved and find out a plan if they're not willing to engage at that point. But of course, that all depends very much on capacity. Um, we need to think about the domestic abuse and where it sits in the context of safeguarding. If you've got any concerns, always get in touch with safeguarding department about that. And it, remember, it's about people who lack the capacity to understand what's happening to them, make decisions to maintain their, maintain their safety. Um, it could be that they don't meet the Care Act criteria, but they might be able to get support from other services, such as domestic abuse charities or services. It might be that there's an undiagnosed dementia that um, we encourage people to seek support from memory services to get that diagnosis so people understand. But remember, we all have a, a, a responsibility under the Capacity Act to support and make best interest decisions for those that we believe don't have capacity. Again, think about your safeguarding, you, you know, your safeguarding training, your safeguarding leads, the local safeguarding processes. Um, and there are always um, places that you can go and ask for seek support and guidance. It's better to um, speak up and, and be wrong than not to speak up at all. So I think for me, it's always about just knowing, familiarise yourself with what would be the route for escalation within your organisation, um, whether you be working in, in domiciliary care or in the residential setting. Um, so when you come across these incidents, you know you feel well equipped to do them, to deal with them. There's lots of information about domestic abuse uh, available at the local council website and most councils and local authorities have similar mechanisms where you can kind of find out more about local services, how to escalate concerns and seek advice. Thank you for watching. If you would like more information, please visit Norfolk and Suffolk Care Support.co.uk where you'll find further training on our learning portal. The link for this website is in the description down below.